I'm Tatiana Antonella Beya, founder of Goombook, and you're listening to Forward Talks, Conversations That Matter. This episode continues our special series, Climate Leaders Rising Up to COP28, in partnership with MasterCard, with the support of Dubai Government Media Office. We're sharing inspiring stories of sustainability leaders and climate champions driving impact from our region to the world. I'm joined today by Jamila Elmir, Senior Advisor to the UN Climate Change High-Level Champion for COP28, Her Excellency Razan Al-Mubarak. Jamila has over 16 years of experience in environmental and sustainability strategy and policy development for master planning and citywide planning, urban waste systems and more. We spoke about the impact of urban growth and the construction sector on the environment and her work with the Climate Champions team. The Climate Champions is the delivery arm, if you want, of, of the UN high-level champion. And any host country appoints a high-level champion for, for two years. So our high-level champion is Her Excellency Razan Mubarak. She's the high-level champion for COP28. And we're blessed to have Dr. Mahmoud Mohyuddin from COP27 together with Her Excellency Razan. Um, and the high-level champion's role was, was created in Paris. Um, in COP21, and it was manda- it's a mandated role. And it was created because the global community realized that traditionally COPs addressed national governments, and there wasn't a high political figure really addressing everybody else, everybody who's not in the negotiation room, everybody who we need to deliver this transition. And this is how the high-level champion role w- was created. The climate champions team is, is really the delivery arm, and this is why where you see that the climate champions team works across different sectors and works with global partners. Uh, and one of these uh, sectors that the climate champions team focus on is the, the built environment uh, sector. Because of your extensive experience uh, in the construction industry and, and then you've been moving on to, you know, climate change, climate action, we would love to hear from you what it means to build, what is the impact globally and, and locally and, and what can be done. The sector is responsible for around 21% of global emissions if you only look at the sector itself. But then if you look at the supply chain, it's responsible for around 40% of the emissions. If you look at the latest NDCs issued by the UAE government, uh, the sector represents around 27% of uh, emissions in, in the UAE. But it is also one of our biggest opportunities to act upon um going forward at the medium term and also at the long term. So if we go again to the NDCs, which are the nationally determined contributions, so it's uh, each country states its targets, its climate targets with several intervals. The UAE has um, put around 80%, 85% of the reductions it wants to achieve by 2030 under the, the built environment sector, which is super exciting for anyone working in that sector because it is going to be the big push Uh, really helping the UAE uh, move in the right direction towards net zero. Um, But this is not a a new story for the UAE. I mean, I I came to the UAE in 2008, but sustainability in the built environment is was embedded in cultural heritage and the, you know, like the cultural architecture. I'm not an expert in that, so I won't talk about it too much. But I think anyone who has lived here and is familiar, you'll recognize the wind towers, the bargils, uh, which were passive cooling methods. So non without any electricity, without ener- energy, without refrigerants. And this is how people used to cool their houses. And you'd recognize also the um, light brown texture of, of, of the walls, which was made from uh, local materials. And then there was a renewal of, of, of sustainability. And, and I'd say from a bit of a biased perspective that this really started um, with two things, um, Estidama in Abu Dhabi and uh, the ambition of Mazdar City. I think what they did, uh, a lot of people outside don't fully see the level of effort that went into it. I remember 
uh, back then working with the Estidama team. So there were two things happening in parallel. Estidama was the green building code, the first ever green building code to be mandated in the world as part of the building permitting process. And that was done by the Abu Dhabi Urban Planning Council back then. What year are we talking about? When was 2008. that? 2008. 2008, um, more or less. I think Mazdar's uh, preparation started a bit earlier. Um, so the two really... Uh, inspirational stories from both of these. I'll start with Estidama. Estidama produced the Green Building Code. I haven't seen that in many other governments, but what they did is nearly a full year free training program for contractors, consultants. Uh, you just register, you walk in, you get trained into the building code. Um, there were a lot of trainings as well for the municipality assessors. And then there was also a rollout when it was mandated in 2010, and there was a feedback loop where the uh, Urban Planning Council was taking feedback from uh, the people submitting the permitting process, from the assessors and the municipalities to say, okay, what's working, what's not working, and then there was adjustment. So even that from a government is very brave, right? Both to, to roll out a full-fledged free training program open to the public uh, over such a long period, and to be willing to take this constant feedback you know it's really like piloting this so I, I thought that was very very brief and it really helped upscale everybody uh, in the Emirates of Abu Dhabi on the counterpart what Mazdar did other than the design and the architectural design um, they they did a piece of work that I think a lot of people don't um, um, fully understand like the level of effort which is um, Future Build and Future Build was an online database of materials with environmental footprint back in 2008. Now, Europe started looking at life cycle assessment of materials in the end of 1990s, etc. But in our region, that was the closest we were getting. And to make this information public, where the procurement team was working with the suppliers to get the right materials for Mosdar and then make that information available for the public. Um, was a great feat uh, in terms of level of effort, but also knowledge knowledge sharing. And, and I do think it, it did help contribute to, to the maturing of, of the market. And then this was followed by Dubai winning Expo. And then Expo raised the bar. And Dubai government also working on its Dubai Green Building Code. And um, I remember working on the sustainability procurement uh, policy of Expo from a design stage. Players like Cares International, it's an NGO that works with steel manufacturers. Because of Expo's specifications, they were able to increase the number of uh, steel manufacturers they worked with from 9 to 34 in the region just because of that push, because everybody wanted to work on Expo. So I think what you, what, what you really saw is a uh, demand-led market shift in the entire supply chain of, 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 of construction. And these success stories kept on coming one after the other, you know, with Majid Al-Futim, with al Dar, with ICD Brookfield, Sustainable City. I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot. And, uh, but, but, you know, we keep on having these leaders wanting to push the boundary. Um, so it's a very, it has been a very dynamic space over the last 15 years. Um, we're still growing in terms of, uh, economy in, ter in terms of, 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 of built environment and population. Uh, so there is still a lot to do, but I, I think it is a good, a good story. We mainly think about buildings when we, mm -hmm. when we discuss the built environment, but uh, it's also related to urban areas and how we live in these urban areas. Um, and there are linkages to other industries. The more we grow our cities, of course, we talk about more transportation needs and, and mobility, need for greenery. Um, I know that Expo, of course, uh, gave a, a very strong, strong imprint on on the importance, for example, of of green spaces, but with indigenous species, with a very um, mm. a big uh, giving a lot of importance of local trees and shrubs, keeping no grass, of course, but the desert being visible, but still very beautiful natural environments. But I, I'm sure there's much, much more behind all this. Yes, so I'll, again, I'll go back to Estidama and planning for Estidama. I think there were some supporting policies and guidelines issued as well as part of that full program of Estidama, which means sustainability in Arabic. 
Um, there was the public realm design manual, which looked specifically at the point you raised in terms of sustainable landscaping, desertscaping or xeriscaping, right? And, and, and looking and valuing the locally adapted uh, species within the public realm. And there was also the urban design manual, which kind of was the first i'd say in the region design guidelines for the urban for the urban setting maximizing walkability and connectivity um so so that that was a, a first and there was a lot of work done to reintroduce pocket parks uh you know like re refurbish the streets etc to allow for that connectivity and walkability w within abu dhabi uh dubai is the first city to have launched the metro 2009 so this concept of 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 you know mass mass transit public public transport uh, and i and i think we are seeing this being rolled out now in the other cities in in, in the region uh, also because of the growing urban population and increasing densities and and slowly you see the layering coming so walkability and connectivity in Abu Dhabi uh, public transport in Dubai we saw the uh, cycle city friendly uh, strategy launched by Dubai as well uh, two years ago I think now so there is this increased push of really relooking at the space you have today within the city and encouraging these alternative modes of, of transport. I think we still have these, the challenge of, of climate, but I know there has been a lot of uh, effort, spe specifically by developers wanting to look at this, at microclimate, thermal comfort, outdoor thermal comfort. Um, Ras Al Khaimah has done a lot of work in that space, specifically in terms of walkability. And the way you do that is by shading, by distances, by uh, your ability to enter and exit from air-conditioned spaces while you're going from point A to point B. Um, the other point to highlight is the, the governance structure. So, for example, in Abu Dhabi, you had the Urban Planning Council, and its remit was to look at, at planning, right? And Dubai recently, I think three years ago as well, um, formed its Urban Planning Committee. And it did have a planning department, but now it's really looking at, at urban planning at, at a new level. They've launched the, the, the Dubai Plan 2040, mm -hmm. correct? Is this the, the, the plan you're talking about when we look at connectivity, mobility? So that was part of it, but mm. there was also the cycle city friendly strategy that was launched after the Dubai 2040 okay. um, in line with the, with the ambition of, of, of 2040 of, of making Dubai a people-centric uh, people -centric city. There, there's a layering, you know, like you put your overarching strategy and then you have to really design every layer. So for cycling, for walkability, for public transport, for even for EVs, right? And we know Dubai Supreme Council of Energy does have a target for uh, electric vehicle penetration into the market, etc. So I think the vision ha has been set. When we come back, I talked to Jamila about her work with the Climate Champions team leading up to COP28. That's right after this short break. I wanted to take a minute and tell you about our partners, MasterCard, who helped make this podcast possible. Did you know that from the 1st of January 2028, all newly produced MasterCard plastic cards will be made from more sustainable materials? Many banks today are already offering sustainable MasterCard products, so you too can become a part of the movement by asking your bank for a sustainable card today. Thank you to MasterCard for their support of Forward Talks and Goombook. Welcome back to my conversation with this episode's climate leader, Jamila Elmir, Senior Advisor to the UN High Level Champion for COP28. So I know that um, as part of the UN Climate Champions, there's a lot of work being done uh, behind the scene, uh, also related to the built environment. Um, and last time we met officially was at the, the roadmap, the Road to COP uh, event. And I think there, there's something very special happened. Yes, yeah, so uh, we met end of May. Uh, at the Road to COP, uh, there, Her Excellency Razan Mubarak had a, uh, a roundtable with some of the leading CEOs of uh, the built environment sector, the developers in, in the UAE. And there was an overwhelming uh, positivity about the sector. 
uh, ambition was ubiquitous. So everybody on the table was already committed to the transition, had already demonstrated leadership and great efforts in the market. And they had also identified um, the next phase of enablers, you know, to help push the sector forward. And, and since then, we formed a, a working group. At, at, at the UAE level to really map out what are these enablers. Um, there, there is so much optimism because this is also fully aligned and working in tandem with the, the, the plans of, of, of the government. So Ministry of Energy launched their demand side, demand side management program in 2021, which has eight policies and, and one of the buckets is the built environment. And when you hear what the market is saying and what's what the ministry is working on, uh, there's such complementarity. Um, and I think the both Ministry of Climate Change and Environment and the Ministry of Energy have been opening more and more doors and platforms to co-create these policies over the past two to three years. Uh, we have the national dialogues, national climate dialogues, uh, and several subcommittees. Um, so really we see an exponential growth and, and collaboration and, and co-design, which which is great. It's so exciting. And I think it's, it's very hard to understand everything that's happening uh, in, in the UAE and um, all the steps that have been taken in such a short time. Mm -hmm. So what do you expect from COP? You know, they always say you have a better view when you're outside of COP uh, because everybody inside is so busy. Uh, the reality is, so under the Climate Champions team, there's a built environment team. The team's been working very hard with global partners like Building to COP Coalition, World Green Building Council, um, and I must say the work that we're doing here is under the umbrella of the Emirates Green Building Council. And, and these players, the, these mobilizers, whether regional, local or international, are, are, are very important uh, because they act as a web of change makers. Um, and, and so our built environment team has been working very hard with the, the global uh, players in, in this uh, industry. Uh, there's been collaboration as well with industry players like the global cement and concrete association and steel uh, steel uh, ngos etc ngos working in the steel industry i don't know everything they're cooking <laughs> but i do know that they're looking at roadmaps both to shift demand uh, demand for greener materials for uh, more sustainable buildings um, and they're also working on the supply side. So, for example, together with the COP presidency, there has been a big effort to look at the hard to abate sectors, cement, steel, concrete, and, and to really create at least this uh, community of practice between the businesses that are wanting to lead this decarbonization. It's not easy. Nobody has figured it out. Um, and I think it, it really boosts efforts when you share both challenges and uh, solutions that have been figured out by industry players. So there's a lot of effort. I don't know what will make it to headlines, but I think the next five to 10 years are going to be, f next five years are going to be very, very exciting in, in this space. Uh, what I can say by this COP is that um, private sector industry has been engaged at, at a new level. Uh, and I think this is something we've seen across COPs. Uh, so it is um, every year we see more and more growth of the action agenda. This is what we call in our space. So anything that is outside of the negotiated po like political discussions is the action agenda. And this has been growing exponentially. It's because you keep hearing we need more private sector involvement. We need blended finance. So if you call on private sector to get involved, they will come with their asks, but also their offers. Um, so there is this increased mobilization. Um, so that that's 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 for sure what I expect in terms of the building sector per se. I I can't necessarily like speak on in terms of the exact outputs um, just yet. But uh, we will be at COP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we'll, uh, well, we'll wait to see what, what happens. And I think there's a lot of expectations from, from very, very different stakeholders uh, locally and globally. But um, having been here for so many years, both of us, we know that uh, the UAE is uh, really capable of mobilizing and inspiring uh, action. So um, 
Yes, and it's just a few days away. <laughs> yeah, and I think the next target we're looking at is 2030, right, as the next step. And, and, and what to achieve by then. Do you have any targets, numbers for 2030? Yes, there are actually. So the 2030 breakthrough agenda um, is what the Climate Champions portfolio looks at. So they both have, they have a... Two, two sets of uh, frameworks, the 2030 breakthrough, which really looks at mitigation targets, and then the Sharm el adaptation agenda, which looks at adaptation targets. In terms of 2030 breakthrough for the building sector, uh, there is this aim that by 2030, all new buildings will be net zero uh, emissions operationally. Wow. And 40% uh, reduced Embodied carbon. <laughs> Incredible. Yes, so that's the aspirational target by 2030. And then there are other targets for cement, steel, um, aluminum as well in terms of number of plants that are net zero emission globally, at least as a proof of concepts for then this to be rolled out across uh, the industry globally. And then on the adaptation side, there's really this focus on shelter, resilient shelter, uh, and Sharm el-Sheikh Adaptation Agenda looks at uh, 4 billion people that are vulnerable. And there are several initiatives that are quite um, inspiring, such as Roof Over Our Heads, which is being led by Sheila Patel, and it's looking at slum dwellers and informal settlements and how they can be a force of, of change for their own communities, but also really mobilize to, to improve the conditions within their own communities. Yes, because um, one of the main focuses of this uh, COP will be adaptation, correct? Correct, yes. Um, this is something that we, we, we try to highlight all the time. Uh, of course, the need of funding yes. for adaptation. At the moment, in the past two years, with all the events uh, we've seen of extreme weather, flooding and, and, and storms and, and hurricanes, um, now we are actually funding rescue and, and mm -hmm. emergency situations, uh, mm -hmm. maybe double the price of what adaptation uh, would have been. So hopefully at COP we'll see also um, some announcements and agreements on in terms of, uh, of funding adaptation for the next uh, decade. A hundred percent. Because also presidency has included... Uh, peace and fragility and speaking of, 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 of peace and the unfortunate events happening in our region, what we're seeing is more dialogue between the development world and the climate world. So the likes of uh, UNHCR and um, IFRC, the International Federation of Red Cross, are really trying to work much cl more closely with the players of the climate agenda because it's much better to prevent than to um, address these challenges after, after the fact. Thank you for joining me today. This special series of Forward Talks is brought to you by Gumbuk in partnership with MasterCard and with the support of Dubai Government Media Office. I'm Tatiana Antonelia Beya, and this episode was produced by Samantha K. Ruz, Anurada Bhattacharya, Janelle Lopez, and Shira Disey. See you again soon.